This episode of New Politics was released on the 1st of June, 2024, and produced on the lands of the Wongal and Gadigal people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, the Prime Minister is crafting an offer for a second term, but what does this actually mean? Is Australia really a racist country? Anthony Albanese calls out the right-wing media for clickbait and being the cheer squad for Peter Dutton. And a vote on Palestine brought on by the Australian Greens fails to get any support. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, science advisor for News Corp. And we've also had a few listeners tell us how they listen to new politics. One of our listeners told us that they listen while they're doing the cleaning up, hopefully not while they've got the vacuum cleaner on. And another listener mentioned that they listen while they're driving to belly dancing classes. And I am a little bit disappointed that it's not actually during the belly dancing class itself. Some have suggested that they listen while they're in the shower. There were a few more unsavoury responses, which we won't go into, but it doesn't really matter how or where you listen into new politics. The most important thing is that you do listen in and that you do engage with the issues. Listeners might be interested to know that I'm actually belly dancing while we talk, while having a shower and cleaning the house, so it's nice to be in uh, solidarity with everyone. And it's really nice to have these comments come back to us and... I hope you continue to enjoy the podcast while you do your weekend jobs. And we've got another shameless plug about our new book, Fixing Australian Politics, How to Change Our System of Government. It's now available for $22.95 for the book or $9.99 for the Kindle version on Amazon. It is available as a free PDF to our Patreon and Substack subscribers. And of course, if you do want to support new politics and independent journalism, you can support us through Patreon or Substack or go to our website at newpolitics.com.au. Parliament has been sitting this week and it started off with the Prime Minister telling the Labor caucus that now they are crafting the offer for second term. And this has been interpreted as get ready for an election, but an election isn't going to happen for some time. It's unlikely that the federal government is going to call an election before the Queensland election in October. And there's also those redistribution issues that affect the timing as well. But we still think that the next election is either going to be held at some point in November or April next year. But aside from that, there's still issues from the current parliament that need to be resolved before there's any talk about agendas for a second term. There's economic management, of course, and inflation went up slightly in the past month to 3.6%, and it does need to be between that band of 2 and 3%. There's a few other areas such as housing and the Future Made in Australia program. There's domestic violence issues. There's issues with energy pricing, which will all be ongoing issues way past the date of the next election. So it's more a case of whether these issues are being managed in the best way possible rather than fully being resolved because they will take many years to be resolved. And also, I think it's still too early for the Prime Minister to start crafting the offer for a second term because this term is still going and it might still be going for another year. One of the issues with three-year terms is that you don't actually get a lot of time to implement larger policy ideas. And we're at the technically the halfway point, or a bit over the halfway point of the, the first term. And already he's they're starting to think about how do they win the next term. Now, I will say it's probably smart to start to think now about needing to put effort into winning the next term rather than taking it for granted. I don't think they can take it for granted. And it's a government whose stocks have fallen pretty quickly for all kinds of reasons. Some is their fault, some perhaps not their fault, but they do need to be thinking about if they want to have a longer legacy than just being another Scullin-esque one-term Labor government, they should be thinking about how do they stave off not so much the Liberal Party, which I don't think can win the next election. I don't think can even gain seats in the next election. I think the Liberal Party will be struggling to maintain what they have. They might win one, one or two seats, but they're not going to get back to anywhere near a governing position at the next election. I think what 
Labor has to worry about is disaffected voters going to Greens or centre-left independents and losing majority government and hence having the work of government that little bit more challenging. And of course, you've always got the far right. And one of the risks of a minority government is that you have a centre-left government with a far right. And by far right, I mean, in Australian terms, people like Qatar and One Nation and Jackie Lambie holding the balance of power in the lower house, finding your legislative agenda is that much harder again with people basically hostile to everything you want to do. So Labor's, in a sense, fighting the election on two or even three fronts. So starting to think about it now is probably not a bad idea. Whether to go public with it now, I don't think that's helping the cause any. We'll put it that way. On the other factor is that the process of government is half about managing the business of government itself. There's crisis management and events that just pop out of the blue. And the other half of the process is managing and implementing your agenda, if you are able to manage the first part of that equation successfully. And elections are then an adjudication about what a government has actually achieved and then an assessment of what they will achieve in the future based on the competence that they might have shown during that parliamentary term. And and then all of that is also judged against the merits of the opposition. And we've also seen this week that immigration has created a few issues for the government, and that relates to deportation of non-citizens or residents who have committed criminal acts and can't be sent anywhere else in the world. And last week, it was all about net overseas migration numbers. So we can see that this will end up being one of those big issues that Peter Dutton and the Liberal Party will keep pushing. And that's because it's his natural territory, if you like, or his natural terrain. And we'll keep ramping this up in the lead up to the next election. So that's one issue for the Liberal Party that they'll keep pushing. But for the Labor government, Labor supporters on the left have suggested that the Albanese government wants to bed down this term and then create the conditions for a long-term government of 10 to 12 years or something like that, and that the second term is going to be the time when all the more radical social policy and traditional Labor types of policies are going to be implemented. But there's no real evidence for this. Labor hasn't given us any ideas so far for what it will do in the second term yet, and that's understandable. You know, it's got to get through this first term first. But if you look at these issues historically, you know, the question is, well, was the second term of the Hawke government more of a Labor government than the first term, or was the second Whitland term more Labor-like than the first term? And you could argue that the second term of the Labor government after 2010 was far more productive than its first term, but that was under a different Prime Minister and Julia Gillard, and it was also far more chaotic politically. But I think a second term of an Albanese government, and this is all presumptuous because he's got to actually get to that point first, but I can't see it being any different to the first term, you know, cautious, steady, slow, unwilling to rock the boat. And I think for all the people that are saying, oh, you know, just watch out, look how radical Labor's going to be in its second term, I just think there's going to be as many people within the Labor Party membership who will be as disappointed as there have been during this first term of government. I suppose this is the time to put in the usual caveat that government is different to opposition and it's not always possible to be completely ideologically pure when you're in government, etc, etc. But there's a perception out there too that Labor has ignored its core values. This isn't the compromises that other Labor governments have had to do to maintain the system of running. This is supporting the tax cuts, supporting AUKUS to the hilt, supporting other foreign affairs issues that really see them on the wrong side of history. We'll be talking about that a bit later. It's about not really tackling the housing problem in a way that a Curtin or a Chifley or even a Hawke, a Hawke or a Keating would have jumped in and put in policies. Now they'd have been held down and told that they were wrong and have News Corp 9 and the rest run after them like they were mangy dogs chasing a bit of rotten meat. But they'd have mostly got it through and they'd have found the way through to at least alleviate the problem, even if it wasn't perfect. And we'd have complained about that too. For those of you about to type in, yeah, you'd have complained about that. Of course we would have. That's our job. Uh, (laughs) But we don't seem to be getting a Labor government that we were shown in opposition and in, in the election campaign. We're living in some kind of bizarre world where the left of Labor 
in some fairly key positions aren't acting like a Labour left government, but actually acting like slightly further to the right, Labour right government, pushing towards even a Liberal moderate government. And it's been put to me that the trouble is, is that as both sides have adopted neoliberal policies, the arguments go into culture war stuff and you don't get substance because there's broad agreement on both sides as to how to run an economy. And this is perhaps where Jim Chalmers needs to step up, Katie Gallagher needs to step up and join dissident voices and force Labor into governing in the way that people want them to govern. There's also been some other suggestions for what else this crafting, the offering for a second term could actually mean. And I'd say that there's probably going to be scraps of policy that can be identified as Labor-esque. And the only party that's more scared of implementing real Labor policy seems to be the Labor Party itself. But the most important part of government is fiscal management and budget concerns. And I think that over the past two years, the Labor government has shown that they're quite capable of this. Not that the media will give them any credit for this at all, but they've done really, really well in this area. And there has been some talk about focusing on the Republic, but no one is really clamouring for this at all within the community. And Australia does have that history of failed referenda without bipartisan support. So that's probably out of the question for a long, long time. There might be more focus on universal service delivery in health and education. And I did notice during the week that the Premier of Queensland, Stephen Miles, has introduced 50 cent fares for public transport all across the state. And this is obviously an election gimmick in the lead up to the Queensland election in October this year. But this is something that really should be commended, I think. And if this plays out well politically, well, I think that federal Labor might start thinking about universal service issues that start reversing the decades of the user pays mentality and start thinking about how all of these issues benefit the community overall. So I think there's a lot of areas to consider there. Maybe governments don't need to do the bells and whistles anymore for election time. It's all about the safe and competent role of government that matters the most. And I think this is the case, especially after the unstable governments that have presided in Australia since around 2010 up until 2022. Maybe that's what interests the electorate the most, you know, safe and stable government. I think safe and stable government... And the Queensland election is all signs at this point suggest that it's going to be a uh, Liberal win or an LNP win for reasons that nobody, including the LNP, can understand as the Queensland state government has performed pretty well. It had a long-standing premier in Anna Palaszczuk. Oh, but sometimes it's a case where the electorate just gets sick of whoever the government is. If they've been in there for a long time, they just think, oh, well, it's that classic Australian feeling, you know, from the electorate. Time to give the other guys a go. Yeah, yeah. And Stephen Miles has done a, a decent job as far as I can tell. He's probably not been perfect, but nobody has. But he hasn't wrecked the joint in the way that David Chris are fully and his team have suggested they have. And of course, that's their job. So, But it may be that it's time for a change in Queensland. Yet there's no reason to vote for Chris Afuli, who's basically said he's just going to be Campbell Newman 2.0 by not giving any policies and not refuting the fact that all these cuts are going to come through that he's being accused of. And Campbell Newman was one of the more disastrous premiers of Queensland, and he only lasted a term. He, he went from one of the biggest majorities in Parliament to one of the very worst losses, not just in Queensland, but in the Australian polity since 1856 and Queensland's former 1860 or thereabouts, and loses in a landslide. Unless Chris Afuli is smarter and more moderate than that, that the same thing is going to happen, it seems. Oh, but I guess the other point is that Stephen Miles is probably going to try out as many Labor-type policies as possible in the lead-up to the next Queensland election. And I guess it's just a question, of, well, the Federal Labor Party will be looking at that to see if any of those are successful and whether they can introduce some policies similar to that at a federal level, not 50 cent train fares, because the federal government is not responsible for public transport. That's an issue that's left up to the states. But it's just a question of whether they will look at these policies that are implemented by Stephen Miles and introduce them on a federal level in some way. Yeah, I'm guessing reduction in doctor's fees, reduction in hex debts, reduction in things that, that people pay for 
a reduction in GST, I think, would be an absolute vote winner. And the Western Australian Premier recently suggested that the system isn't great and Western Australia gets far more of their share than New South Wales or Victoria does. So a, a change to make it simpler, a change to make it less onerous from 10% to, say, 7.5% might be something federal labour could do to, to show that they're serious about uh, alleviating the cost of living. Of course, watch prices go up 2.5% in supermarkets everywhere, but that's part of living in Australia. And we also had that idea of national service brought up as an issue during the week, and this is based on the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announcing that if the Conservatives win the general election next month in the UK, they'll introduce national service. And the Conservatives over there are way behind in the polls, and this announcement, I think, would probably have just about sealed their defeat. And in Australia, Senator Jackie Lambie brought it up as an issue, as she does every two or three years. If you're not learning or earning, then you are serving. And I want to speak really, really out there to those kids that are um, sort of 21 and below. We haven't got the feet on the ground. I don't want to scare you. I just want you to have some skill sets where, especially with national disasters, we can go, hey, guys, 24 hours, grab your packs, go and help out. So this does come up every two or three years, and every two or three years the same responses are given, that national service would be unworkable, it's counterproductive, it's too costly to implement. It's questionable whether the skills that are being provided would be that useful, and even if they were, the need for this type of workforce might be required only once every 10 years or so, and even if they are, they might have forgotten all of those skills that they've acquired. So I think it's another one of those ill-conceived ideas that gets traction once in a while, Older people, as in over 80, have said that it's a great idea, probably because they wouldn't have to do it. Peter Dutton has said that he wouldn't rule it out. And I just think that in a free society, there shouldn't be conscription or national service. Not many countries around the world have got it, and I don't think Australia should have it either. Military professionals hate it because you end up getting a lot of recruits who don't want to be there, have no skill nor interest in a military career. And it's just not something that particularly in peacetime works it makes our neighbors nervous why is australia expanding its army and i don't want to disparage by the way the service of conscripts in say vietnam who went over and uh, endured some horrific experiences but in peacetime particularly there's no point to military service it's the last call the final final last call of the extremely desperate Rishi Sunak has rightly been pilloried. Uh, the memes have been hilarious over his ideas of national service. <laughs> and, of course, he knows he's going to lose, so he can make any wild claim. Well, it's also probably not about winning the election. It's more about minimising the losses. Yeah, if you can get more over 65-year-old conservative voters out to vote, that might save a few seats and stave the drubbing that they're going to get. So a lot of people calling for it never did it. And in one of those side bits of history, because there was a generation expecting to do two years of national service, ended up not doing the national service and ended up forming bands like the Beatles, like the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds. All of these guys suddenly found themselves freer to pursue creative. It's quite interesting how these things play out. But in Australia, it, it won't work. I know that they're struggling to get recruits, but I'd venture to suggest that they're struggling to get recruits because the military culture from the outside seems a bit toxic. Why would you join something that needs a big shake up at the top? And it's harder. We see every year with Anzac Day, it's harder to push the glorious tradition of military service. So, yeah, I, I think that these, having just spoken on it for a few minutes, we're better to ignore these calls because they're nonsense and will never work. This is New Politics with Eddie Djokovic and David Lewis, one of Australia's top 10 podcasts on Australian politics and news commentary. You can also find us at newpolitics.com.au and you can also support us through Patreon and Substack.
Racism is a part of the national debate again, and this has been highlighted after the ABC journalist Laura Tingle spoke at the Sydney Writers' Festival on the weekend and said this when she was asked about the Coalition's statements about reducing immigration. For a major political leader to be saying, as Nikki says, you know, everything that's going wrong in this country is because of migrants. And, you know, I had this sudden flash of people turning up to try to rent a property or at an auction and they look a bit different, whatever you define different as, that basically he has given them licence to be abused. We are a racist country, let's face it, we always have been and it's very depressing, but to give licence like that I find profoundly depressing and a terrible prospect for the next election. And this set off howls of protests over at News Corporation demanding that Laura Tingle be reprimanded and sacked immediately. Here's Sophie Ellsworth from Sky News with her opinions. The ABC have a very serious problem on their hands. Laura Tingle is not only their chief political correspondent for their flagship program on politics, the 7.30 report, she is the ABC staff elected board member. Now, they have a problem because she's coming out with very partisan views that she, uh, you know, was happy to air at the Sydney Writers' Festival uh, yesterday. This has dominated news headlines all around the country today. Uh, And this is a problem for Chair Kim Williams. He came out just two months ago and said he does not want journalists at the network that are not impartial. So this is an absolute nightmare for the ABC. And the ABC made the fatal mistake of thinking that comments made at the Sydney Writers' Festival would go undetected. News Corporation's got the ears and eyes everywhere around Australia. It's almost as bad as Mossad or MI5. And once again, a journalist who put out some views that is counter to the position of the Liberal Party and the viewpoints of News Corporation is castigated and humiliated on a national stage. And I think that we do have a problem with racism in Australia and it's an issue that is so evident in many circles and there's probably that perception of racism being defined as you know that old guy at the pub who shouts obscenities at black people or on public transport and a lot of people rightly don't identify with that but that's not exactly what it is it's all of these other issues historically indigenous people have been excluded there's terra nullius we had the white australia policy the yellow peril invasion from china we had that immigration dictation test which was set up to exclude foreigners blackbirding slavery black deaths in custody the rhetoric of african gangs islamophobia and here's that favorite quote from lang hancock in 1984 those that have been assimilated into you know, earning good living or earning wages amongst the civilised areas that have been accepted into society and they have accepted society and can handle society, I'd leave them well alone. The ones that are no good to themselves and can't accept things, the half caste, and this is where most of the trouble comes, I would dope the water up so that they were sterile and would breed themselves out in the future and that would solve the problem. So this is what Australia is, and that's not to say that Australia is an awful and terrible country. It's absolutely not. But for some people, it is, just based on the colour of their skin or for being from a different background. And I think that if the problem of racism isn't identified and acknowledged, well, the problem just keeps going on. It's incredible that an arguable point, and I've said in the past that I think we're getting better, but I don't think we're there yet. And one of the things that dismayed a lot of us listening, was the result of the referendum. Not only did it lose, it lost in every state. It did win in the ACT. did win in the, which isn't a state. <laughs> and I know that the 40% of people who voted yes, voted yes for pure of heart reasons. And that 40% gives me hope for the future because that 40% skewed young. And if it was to happen in 20 years' time, that 40% might be 60%. And it's not just old people having said that. We are so entrenched in it that it's hard sometimes to realise what is racist. You say things or people say things that are meant to be innocuous and horrify them when it's pointed out. Actually, that's making assumptions based on race or that's something that, you know, and that when Laura Tingle or anyone, Yasmin abdul Magid, makes some reasonable arguments about Anzac Day and what it means and gets hounded out of the country. Now, you're not going to hound Laura Tingle out of anywhere. (laughs) Uh, And I don't blame 
Yasmin Abdul-Magid for, for leaving. I wish she had stayed. But once again, we can see that the ABC is being targeted by News Corporation. And even though yeah. the ABC these days, in my opinion, is almost like an offshoot of News Corporation with its pro-Liberal Party commentary, but even still, anyone who steps out of line according to what is defined by News Corporation, well, they cop the barrage. And then there's calls for them to be sacked and for the ABC to be defunded. And that's exactly what happened with Laura Tingle during the week. And Laura Tingle's commentary was provided in response to questions put to her about the coalition's immigration policies. And wouldn't you believe it? Laura Tingle is a political analyst and a commentator and was asked to provide political analysis and commentary on immigration. And that's exactly what she did. And it's clear that Peter Dutton and the Liberal Party are ramping up issues related to immigration and then they're using immigration reduction as a solution to everything. You know, housing prices will come down if we reduce immigration, jobs will come back, the economy will improve, road congestion will go. And these are all things that Peter Dunn has actually said. He may as well say that the streets will be paved with gold. Everything will be resolved if only we can reduce migration, which of course is code for reducing the number of black people or people of difference coming into the country. And I think Laura Tingle was right to comment on this. You know, in pretty much a small venue in Redfern and with a smallish audience and we wouldn't have heard anything about this except for some zealot in the audience probably someone from news corporation who decided to make some political mileage out of this and it's almost like the stasi police or the gestapo you know you're not allowed to think anything else except for what news corporation wants you to think and if you do they'll try and make you disappear it it, it was astounding that the board didn't say or the chair didn't say Laura Tingle is a valued member of the staff. She has robust opinions and in a free and fair democracy and with a national broadcaster, we want a whole range of ideas and we value Laura Tingle's contribution to the ABC. End of story. And it would have, instead of, oh, I counselled her and oh, yeah, oh, oh, I just think it's cowardice. I think it goes against the charter of the ABC. Not a few people have pointed out other shows in which far more controversial but leaning right views are uh, expressed. Australia all over with these rather traditional views of what Australia should be made up of. I know there's a lot of you out there who find shows like Insiders and Q&A with their continual opposition guests being brought in as spokespeople for the government problematic. We have... The religious programs, all of these are representative of part of Australia. We need to have a full representation. And if Laura Tingle or Tony Armstrong says something that News Corp doesn't like, then they should be allowed to say it. The the ABC can say this doesn't necessarily represent the views of the ABC. That's okay. But to really sanction Laura Tingle for saying that a country that's first major piece of legislation passed on the first day of Parliament was the white Australia policy that remains a keystone legislative piece till 1972 to claim that Laura Tingle is wrong to call Australia a racist country is almost performative comedy. Well, it is. And that issue of the ABC not protecting its journalists and its employees, I think that's a really big issue. And Laura Tingle is actually on the board of the ABC as the staff representative, but whenever there's criticism of the ABC by a news corporation, well, the ABC just doesn't stand by its journalists and employees. It stands with news corporation. Stan Grant cops abuse from news corporation. He's not supported by the ABC. He then resigns. But Yasmin abdul Magid, as we discussed before, also attacked by a news corporation, not supported by the ABC. Her contract was not renewed. She goes overseas. Antoinette Latouf, also attacked by a news corporation and the Israel lobby in Australia. She's unfairly dismissed and sacked from the ABC. Now, Laura Tingle is not going to be as easy to remove, as you suggested before, David. She's a senior journalist and she's also on the ABC board up until 2028, so that's another four years. So she's not going to go. And generally, I think it's about time that the ABC grew some spine and started supporting its staff instead of behaving like some innocent bystander and supporting the work of News Corporation. If I was on the ABC, News Corp would have got a completely different (laughs) response. And... If they'd come out and said, look, Laura Tuggill has said Australia's 
a racist country. Well, here's some evidence to suggest that she's wrong and discussed it like adults. That would have been okay. But they just went in in this flying, look at this woke tingle, said this at the Sydney Writers Festival, which I already saw had accusations of being woke. And yeah, woke, I'm pretty sure is if you don't like it, it's woke. If you do like it, it's not woke. Because none of them ever get invited because they have nothing of substance to say. You know, a prime minister released a book. You'd think that he would be invited to the Sydney Writers' Festival. But why wasn't he? Because the book is no good. And there's there's nothing of any substance. And there's plenty of other writers out there who need to be profiled. We weren't invited, but that's because we're too awesome. We're, we're not big enough. You know, it, it does tend towards the bigger publishers. And that's fine, you know. I think that they saw a a chink that they could go after Laura Tingle, who continually destroys coalition figures in interview. She also destroys Labor figures in interview. I don't want to say she's biased. She's one of the few journalists that I think does a decent job in the Australian press. There's a few others, but these journalists are on the minority. And of course, it's easy, and we speak from experience here, to be a talking head spouting opinions all the time, (laughs) to take on someone in a room and and hold them to account is a very hard job. And that's what they don't like about her. This is New Politics, available through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Audible and YouTube, and also available to support at Patreon, Substack, and at our website, newpolitics.com.au. And this also relates to other issues of media behaviour. Sky News and News Corporation are pretty much political activists for the Liberal Party and for conservative politics in general, and they've made this strong push to agitate for the removal of Immigration Minister Andrew Giles and to be honest he's been close to useless in that portfolio and an excellent example of how factional deals in the Labor Party can result in some hopeless ministers in cabinet but it's not up to media players and people outside the political process to agitate for this change and behave like political activists and that's exactly what they're doing but the general behavior of the mainstream media it does need to change and we've made calls for reforms to the mainstream media for some time and and we ended up getting a small glimpse of the prime minister recognizing that yes this is a problem quite often some of the articles are essentially about clickbait these days there are media organizations are under pressure so you have quite dramatic headlines and then you read the articles and the articles can be reasonable but the headlines are there you do have a blurring of news from opinion as well. There are some journalists who are more stenographers in particularly the the right-wing media than actual journalists. They're a cheer squad. Some of the transcripts that you read from Peter Dutton essentially is him just saying, yes, I agree with particular radio commentators or, or TV commentators. And I think that is unfortunate that there's pressure on. There's very few journalists who have the opportunity to write long-form pieces. I know that when years ago, of course, people like Alan Ramsey wrote, you know, one column every Saturday and then had a smaller one on a Wednesday and it was a considered piece. There was research, there was people that had been spoken to. Some journalists do that now too, but it is far less frequent. And I think one of the things that that means is that for some of the publications, you sort of look at a front page and say, well, that'll be gone tomorrow because there isn't substance to it. And that was a clip from the Democracy Sausage podcast produced by the Australian National University. And Similar to the Sydney Writers' Festival where there's a relatively small audience, Albanese might have thought that he could be a little bit more candid discussing these issues on a podcast managed by 
the ANU, but at least we get an idea that he's got an understanding of the issue. But the big puzzle is why he refuses to do anything about it. And there are many problems within the mainstream media. News Corporation has started a round of sackings of middle managers and senior editors. And we've questioned before whether the mainstream media still does have the same influence over political matters that it used to have. But the issue is that the government still behaves as though the media has got this massive control over its messaging and maybe it needs to change its own behaviours to match what the reality is. Actually, I think we need to just revoke all media licences and start again. I think the ABC, the new chief isn't shaping up in the way that we were assured he would. Now, the the chair has very little control over content, etc., etc., but the chair does set the direction of the ABC. The ship takes a while to turn. Let's be fair, too. And there's been a couple of positive things, I guess. Philip Adams' retirement, they've announced uh, he's being replaced by David Ma, which is good. Uh, You know, it was a worry that it could have been... Amanda Vanstone. For example. Yeah. (laughs) So someone who fills the same type of space, but is a serious and worthy replacement to what was really an iconic radio show. Um, I appeared on it once, so I've got a soft spot for it. So all may not be lost, but they've got to really grow up and deal with News Corp properly, which is ignore it. The government has to really start to act. As I said, cancel all licenses now and make everybody reapply and bring in rigorous qualifications that we know half of them won't match. Oh, well, we know that Anthony Albanese is quite cautious on so many issues, but he seems to be cautious and reactive to the media and bases his actions on how News Corporation might react or what the audience listening into 2GB or other talkback radio stations might be thinking. And as we know, News Corporation essentially is a branch of the Liberal Party and the home of the Institute of Public Affairs. And the Liberal Party is the political wing of News Corporation. But the influence of the mainstream media we've talked about this before, David, it is waning. But Anthony Albanese, I'd say that because he's been in Parliament for over 28 years, he's that old-style politician who still plays up to the mainstream media. But as far as I'm concerned, it's a bit of a paper tiger where it just doesn't have that influence in the same way anymore. And because of this continued belief in the influence of the media, it also means that the Liberal Party can also influence the government while being in opposition, solely based on how certain issues play out in the media. So it's like the Liberal Party not needing to be in government because it can still dictate the terms even though it's in opposition. It just supposes everything. Then all of this gets magnified by their supporters in the mainstream media. And I really don't know how all of this will play out in the next federal election, whenever that is called, but I just don't think that the mainstream media is as powerful as Anthony Albanese thinks it is. And it's still got that influence. There's no question about that, but just not as much as it used to have. And perhaps this diminishing push for a royal commission or at least an inquiry into the media is related to the problems that the media industry is having at the moment, but that really shouldn't be an excuse. They're as badly behaved as they've ever been. And Even the strong supporters of a Royal Commission into the media, such as Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and she came onto the podcast last year to talk about reforming the media, and I think that she's even been more forceful than us about it. But she recently said that there's no need for an inquiry anymore and that News Corporation does have some good journalists there. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but that's a pretty stunning turnaround. But generally, I think we still do need to have a media inquiry, and based on what Albanese has said on a fairly discreet podcast, albeit in smaller circles, he probably believes that too, but it's just that he's not keen to do anything about it. It'd be interesting to get Senator Hanson Young back on the show to take her through her reasoning as to why she's changed her mind. There may be good reasons. One of the things she did say, and I've always said this, is that there are good journalists who work for News Corp, and every now and then they do good stories. It's not about the occasional, oh, that was worthwhile and interesting. It's about the whole culture needing to change and needing to change urgently. Oh, that's right. But also News Corporation has got over 1,000 journalists working there, so you would expect at least one or two good ones there. And in fact, it's less now. They cut a couple of hundred journalist jobs yesterday. (laughs) And it's interesting, isn't it? Whenever media organisations or universities 
cut funds. They don't get rid of administrative staff who maybe shouldn't be there anymore because they've got re- genuinely redundant jobs. They get rid of journalists and or academics. And to me, the job losses with News Corp reek of panic. They're trying to they're, they're trying to offset the revenue losses, which they're just not getting through advertising anymore. And yeah, if I knew how to fix it, I'd send them a report and a hefty bill, but I don't, so I won't. The Australian Greens also put forward a motion to hold a debate over the recognition of the state of Palestine and this was shut down very, very quickly. The vote was defeated by 80 votes to 5 in the House of Representatives so even holding a debate on recognising Palestine isn't allowed and this was more of a parliamentary stunt by the Australian Greens and defeated through parliamentary tactics but even still it still shows how dismissive the Australian government and the parliament overall is of the concerns of Palestine. And some of our listeners have asked us, well, sure, Palestine is an issue, but what's it got to do with Australia? And I'd say that it's got a lot to do with Australia. It's about the duplicity of policy and statements, especially from the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and the Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, who are now saying totally different things about Palestine compared to when they were in opposition. And I think it's about the moral backbone and the courage of political leaders. How can we trust what they say on important issues if they're just so willing to change their mind at the drop of a hat? And this might also be an issue that the overall electorate is not overly concerned about, but there is a sizable part of the electorate that this is a very big issue for. And pro-Palestine supporters have been ridiculed and told that they couldn't even point to the River Jordan on a map. And Former Prime Minister Julia Gillard came out during the week to claim that people have ill-informed and unbalanced views about the Israel-Hamas conflict because of social media. So I think there is an interesting dynamic being played out in Australian politics over the genocide in Palestine. It's a similar dynamic also being played out for British Labor in the UK, and they've got their general election coming up next month. But the Labor government here and their UK counterparts Well, they're just too frightened to say anything at all that will upset the Israel lobby groups and affect their electoral fortunes. I think it all pretty much comes down to that. In 20 years' time, do you want Australia to be the country that was on the wrong side of history? Genocide, and it is a genocide, is always wrong. They can't hide behind the usual misdirections anymore because the internet exists. And this is why... People like Julia Gillard came out and said, oh, people are misled by the lies on the internet. And yes, there are plenty of lies on the internet from both sides. But the truth also filters through. And the truth is, is that the figure has been 30,000 for about a month. But there's deaths every day. So we don't know what the actual figure is. And I find it shameful that a government that is filled with people who have spent sided with Palestine, even when it was unpopular, who have spoken out against aggressive land grabs, are now pretending that they're good Zionists and that the argument for taking the land is valid. The argument's not valid. And again, this goes back to my earlier point that when you're in government, sometimes you can't do exactly what you want. And even occasionally, sometimes you've got to go against what you believed in so you can get what you want down the track but I can't see what it is what they want down the track I think the other factor is that you don't really need to have a map or be an expert in geography to be outraged about a genocide or war crimes and the other factor is that we live in a supposedly pluralistic society and we should be able to talk about different views and different opinions whether we like it or not but This whole process, I think, continues that one-sided conversation in Australia about an obvious genocide and obvious war crimes. And if you are outraged about this obvious genocide and war crime, well, you're told that you don't know where the River Jordan is or you're told by a former 
Prime Minister that you don't really know what you're talking about or you're just a fool influenced by social media. And I just find this so condescending and, you know, not just for young people, and that's who all of these comments have been directed towards, but it's condescending for all of the people who believe in the cause of Palestinian freedom. And the Foreign Minister Penny Wong is just being as mealy-mouthed and equivocal as she always has been on Palestine. Here she is speaking during the week. You may recall that uh, the Prime Minister and I have both said in relation to Rafa uh, that we, our message to the Netanyahu government, do not go down this path. The international community has been won on this. What we have seen in the past 24 hours reinforces why we and the international community issued this warning. The death and destruction uh, in Rafa is horrific. This human suffering is unacceptable. And we reiterate to the Government of Israel this cannot continue. We must see an immediate humanitarian ceasefire so civilians can be protected and Australia continues to support the work of the United States, Qatar and Egypt to that end. And continue to, we continue to call for the release of all hostages by Hamas and for Israel to allow aid to flow at scale as directed by the International Court of Justice. And I think we're already getting a taste of what Labor could expect if they do make any favourable positions on Palestine at this stage. Sky News is attacking the Labor government anyway, and Josh Frydenberg, in his new role of Director of Zionist Propaganda Documentaries for Sky News, is already ramping up the claims of the government not doing enough to reduce anti-Semitism in Australia. And I think it's the same process as with Keir Starmer in the UK or Joe Biden in the US. Anthony Albanese is too fearful of being labelled anti-Semitic in the lead up to the next federal election. And I think the Liberal Party will probably run with that message anyway, but that's probably the main reason for their reluctance to move at all on Palestine. I don't agree with it, but that's probably one of the reasons. And I didn't think that this was actually possible, but Australia might have more Zionist influence than the US or in Britain, remembering that Australia was on the verge of setting up a Zionist state in the Kimberley region of Western Australia in the 1930s, before that was knocked back by the West Australian Parliament at the time. But aside from that, it's just hard to accept that the Australian government is just so indifferent to what's going on in Gaza. And we're going to keep talking about this and especially having so many current and former Labor politicians being so indifferent about it as well. And it's getting worse by the day, but it looks like Australia won't move on this until way after the next election, maybe not even at all when it gets to that stage. The term anti-Semitism, and I say this with a lot of anguish, but it's been watered down so much to be essentially meaningless which is bad because that then will encourage genuinely anti-Semitic behaviour. The groups who've, who've used it to try and shut down their own oppositions have overplayed their hands. Now, again, genuine anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism is not criticising a government. It might be criticising a government because that government is Jewish, but it's not taking a bad policy such as genocide and saying this policy is wrong. That's not anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic is taking, and I note there's been arguments over the etymology of the term. The Semitic people live basically on the Levant, which is Israel, Palestine, bit of Jordan, bit of Syria, different to the Arab people. So the Semites are those. So it's not linked with the religion. Again, it's just astounding that Australia finds itself on the wrong side of history with a nominally left, nominally Labour government. I could sort of understand if it was Morrison with his religious zealotry. And even Rudd, who I don't think is that type of Christian, but of course he signed that letter supporting Israel. I don't understand Labour left, who've always been very vocal about the Palestinian people. I don't understand that at all. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.